Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hope you're all having a good day. I'm tired already. And this is not, we're just starting. Um, we are going to go live on Facebook, but while we're waiting for Ed to make that happen, I, we're going to tell you that you should remind you, because you've, you've been here before, you should know to choose a language. Even if you're an English speaker, you should choose a language. Go down to English. I'm sorry, go down to interpretation at the bottom of your screen and click on either English, Spanish, or Korean. Um, and um, I'm going to now ask Lorna to please come on and explain how to get the Spanish interpretation. Lorna, are you able to? I'm not hearing you, Lorna. So let me, let me, um, oh, there she is. Uh, there you go. There you go. Okay, good. I was in English and I couldn't hear you. So now I'm, now I can hear you. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. And Helen, if you could um, explain it in Korean, please. Um, Helen, I am not hearing you, but maybe she's doing it on the Korean channel. Helen, you need to unmute. Oh yeah, Helen, you, can you unmute? There we go, go ahead. I'm still not hearing. Are you hearing, Ed? Yes. Okay. All right. I don't know why mine is not working. So go keep going, Helen. Okay. Thank you, Helen. Um, appreciate it. For some reason, I am not hearing right. Um, Ed, you, are you guys hearing me okay? I'm hearing you okay. Helen was speaking in the Korean channel. Oh, that's why. Okay. I was not hearing it for the Korean channel. Okay, great. All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. We're going live on Facebook. And if any of you want to share it so that people can hear it. Um, and we want to um, make sure that everybody's chosen it for those of you, because I know a lot of people have already have just gotten in. Make sure that you choose the right panel, I mean, the right, the lang right language, sorry. Um, so, uh, so let's get started. All right, um, thank you all for joining us. My name is Judy Mark. I am the president and co-founder of Disability Voices United. We're an organization that um, is directed by people with disabilities and their families. And we uh, were founded by the people who got the self-determination law passed and created the self-determination program. So we're so happy to have you. Um, really, I, I know there's so many names here that I don't recognize. So I think we're having a lot of people for the first time, which is fantastic. We're thrilled to have you. We meet every week or every other week, and we discuss different aspects of the self-determination program. And then we take your questions as well. So we, you should know that we've been meeting for over a year. We started um, well over a year ago um, in having these meetings. Uh, you can find all of the past meetings that we've had um, on um, the, uh, on, on the, on our website, which you're going to see in the chat, it's called the interchange.org and pick the self-determination interchange. Um, I just want to ask um, Ed real quick. I'm noticing that on Facebook, it's it's the entire screen that's being shared as opposed to 
just uh, the speaker view? Is there a way that you can change yeah. that? I should have just fixed it. It'll be delayed a, a couple of seconds, but it should. Okay, fabulous. Thank you so, so much. Um, so um, we are going to, it's fixed. I see it. Thank you so much. Um, uh, so we're going to get started today going back in time and starting over with some of the topics that we started with a year ago. Um, so last week, in case you weren't with us, we did a a uh, an hour and a half on overview of the self-determination program. We called it SDP 101. And this week we're diving into the person-centered plan because the person-centered planning process is the core of self-determination. And we want to make sure that people understand the importance of it. Um, I'm excited to once again um, invite Molly Kennedy to help co-present with me. Um, I, we have created a, a um, PowerPoint presentation for you all, and I'm going to get started with that. Remember that if you want to ask a question, you can do the, you can do it a number of ways. You can do it in the chat. Um, and Ed is going to be monitoring the chat and will be asking me the questions from the chat. You can also use the raise hand feature, which is at the bottom of your screen under reactions and raise your hand. You can also, um, uh, uh, so, so that would be verbally, that means you're gonna be asking a question. Um, and, uh, and either of those ways are fine for, for us to get your questions. And we will not get to all of your questions. I know that for a fact, um, but we will try to get as many as possible. So I am gonna share my screen right now and start this presentation. Um, so today we are talking about um, the person-centered plan uh, and wh why it is important to the self-determination program. Um, we know everybody knows you have to do a person-centered plan, uh, except that many of you are are um, are saying, "Oh, it's just like we just got to get it over with so we can get into the self-determination program." But that's not the point. The person-centered plan is critically important. And I'm going to say this now, and I'm going to say this a hundred times. The person center plan is not the same thing as your IPP. And I'm going to show you the many different ways that it is different. And I'm going to show you the many ways that they intersect and how, how the person center plan informs your IPP. Your IPP is very important. It's critically important. It's your contract with the regional center and the state to provide you with funding for your self-determination program. But the IPP is different than your person-centered plan. So let's get started. Um, oops, hold on, I have to click the right thing. Okay, so, um, so person-centered planning is, you, you probably heard of this from your regional center. I, I, don't, I don't always start with this, but today I am. That it's, it, it's that you decide what's important to you that makes your life a good life. And it's also you plan for what is important for you to make sure you're healthy and safe and comfortable in your community. The problem with the IPP process, the IEP process in, um, in the school system with when you go to the doctors in so much of the medical model of how we look at disability is that the only thing we ever focus on is what's important for you. So we talk about correcting your behavior and changing the way you do things and making you better in some kind of way, fixing you. And person-centered planning is not about fixing you. It's, it's about supporting you to meet your goals and your hopes and your dreams. And so it is really, you need to understand that it is, is totally different than the way you've been thinking about your life or your family member's life for their entire life, okay? So, so it is, we call it a paradigm shift, which means that it's changing the way you think about yourself or about people with disabilities. So there are some very important values of the self of, of person center planning. And, and these are values that we learned from Sally Burton Hoyle, who's one of the great um, uh, person center planners and trainers on certain center person center planning in the country. She's based out of Michigan. And the number one thing is that we have to presume competence. 
And for those of you who are professionals, for those of you who are family members, sometimes this can be hard, particularly for people who maybe um, don't communicate through speaking. Maybe it's difficult because you don't know always what this person desires and what their hopes and dreams are. And, but you have to presume that they have preferences and that they have that they want to make some choices in their lives. Maybe they can't make super duper complex choices, but then who of us actually makes complex choices without supports from other people, right? So all of this is about uh, you know in ensuring that the person is actually at the center of that planning process. It's also really different because it focuses on strengths as opposed to deficits. So if you went to school, you'll notice that they would say, um, Johnny can't do this. Jane can't do that. And they need to work on it. 80% of the time, they'll be able to greet someone when they walk in the door. I mean, th that is not the way a person-centered plan works. It is not about all the things you can't do and let's figure out how a way to make you do them. It is really about what are the things that make you happy? What are the things that, that give you, uh, that, that keep you motivated in life? And let's build upon those things. Um, the, um, the, the next piece is that behavior is communication. We, ha we have to acknowledge that when somebody is sitting um, in a person-centered planning meeting, and they walk out the door, it means they're done with that planning meeting, or maybe they need a break from that planning meeting. So that doesn't mean that you continue with the discussion without the person sitting in the room. So there are some people who really can't sit at a meeting for long periods of time. So you have a discussion with them in advance and say, do you want to be there for this discussion? Do you want to be there for that discussion? And get an agreement from them of what's important to them in, in being part of that planning process. Um, the other thing is the agreement that everyone can make choices that um, I remember when we were first starting to do um, trainings on the self-determination program back in 2014 after the law passed. I remember meeting this mom. She was amazing. She said, this sounds so great, but I don't, my daughter is in, is in a hospital bed most of the time. She has epilepsy. She, she's non-speaking. She, um, she couldn't possibly express, make any choices or express preferences. And so I asked her these questions. Well, you know, so does that mean that she, you know, whatever food she's given, she eats it all? She said, oh, no, no, no. She can't stand spinach. I said, okay, well, there's a preference. So you've got to make sure in a person-centered plan it says never ever serve me, you know, spinach. I said, does she have a preference of a person, one person or another? And the mom said, oh yes. I mean, when this one nurse walks in the room, she turns her head, but this other nurse walks in the room, she gets a big smile on her face. I said, well, I would be firing the nurse that where she turns her head. That's her preference of which which staff she likes and which staff she doesn't. So you need to look at. And when we say behavior, I don't mean like maladaptive behavior. I'm talking about common things uh, of nonverbal cues that you get from people that gives you an indication of what their choices and preferences are in their lives. Um, you also have to, everyone has to believe that, that all people with disabilities can have a meaningful life in the community and not be segregated away and not be isolated away in, in settings that don't allow them to be part of our community. Self-determination is all about inclusion. And in fact, you're required that all services that you purchase with the self-determination program are inclusive. And then finally, person-centered planning cannot be done correctly if you don't respect the, the cultural diversity of that individual. So it might, you know, culture is very, um, is a very broad term. So it may be their ethnicity, it may be their race, it may be a, their, the language that they speak at home, it may be their religion, it may be that they're, they live in a rural area, it may be that they have multiple generations living in their household. So what their culture is can be a family culture, but it could also be a uh, a racial and ethnic culture and or it could be very much of how you want to live your life and that has to be respected. Um, Molly, can I ask you to take on the, the circle of support because I know that this is so important to you. Uh, yeah, 
So it's important before you even start creating the plan that the individual decides who they want to be part of, uh, be part of creating the plan. So it's participants who the individual wants in their circle of support. And they're there to provide advice, support, contact, ideas, feedback, as plain as implemented, as the plan is implemented. So as family members, you might think, oh, I want their service provider or the head of their day program, or, but the person might be like, nah, I don't want them. I don't see a role for them. So it really should be individual that support the person, believe that the person can live out their life and pursue and pursue goals that they want to pursue. And you're there if you're part of the circle of support to what it did, support them. So you're not just sitting there talking about that person. You're there to support them, creating the plan, and then how they implement the plan. Thank you so much. Um, it, remember that, and this is one of the biggest concerns that I've seen when I've seen when I've been been either part of person centered plans or, or planning meetings. I should say is that you have to make sure that the, the people in the room are the right people in the room. Um, so that circle of support that Molly was talking about is so critical because they're not only people that you know and trust, but they're also people that can help you meet your goals. So if let's say you um, want to get a job as a gardener um, and maybe your cousin knows somebody who owns a gardening company or a landscape architect company who and you know who you get to know that having that person, that landscape architect coming to your, person center planning meeting is the right thing to do because they're going to help you meet your goals. Um, so your, your circle of support should be filled with people that you trust, but it, but you can really expand it so that you have all the right people in the room. All right. So moving on. Um, so just an overview of what person center planning is. It provides that information and support to make sure that the individual directs that process. They have to be in charge of that process to the fullest extent that they can. So that may mean um, my friend Tim, who I'm going to his person-centered plan next week is literally everything he's saying, these are the people I want, this is the agenda that we're gonna have, this is how I wanna talk about it. He's clearly driving every single aspect of it. Or it might be the individual like my son who says, I want support in how to run this meeting. I know what I wanna do and then other people can do other pieces of it. Um, as I said before, you focus on the strengths, the preferences, the needs of people and the desired outcomes. It is not about fixing people, it's about hopes and dreams, remember that. Um, this is a really critical one. It happens, it seems so simple. It happens at the time and place that is convenient to the individual, not that is convenient to the independent facilitator or to the service coordinator, um, but to the actual individual. So I remember I was doing some training a few years ago at a regional center to some service coordinators about, about self-determination. And it just coincidentally happened to be on a Monday and the day before on Sunday morning is when my son's person-centered plan had taken place. And I said, I was training and I said, yeah, like yesterday was my son's person-centered planning meeting. And I, and I started talking about it and I said, his service coordinator was there. And the, there was a service coordinator in the room who said, oh, I would never work on a Sunday. Like you, you wouldn't, I would never show up to a person-centered plan on a Sunday. 
Okay, well, then you're not going to be part of my son's. If you were my son's service coordinator, you would not be part of my son's person center planning team because Sunday morning was the best time for him to have it. So remember that nobody should be forcing you and, and looking at their calendar and saying, let me see when I'm free. What works for you? If morning's best, if night is best, in your own living room or at a restaurant, whatever works for you. I'm obviously taking into an account an individual's culture. Um, we, we, I remember hearing about a person-centered plan where it was from an Orthodox Jewish family where people really needed to be required to dress modestly at the person-centered planning meeting. These are, these are the things that people have to take into account. Or if people are going to be speaking Spanish, you want to make sure that if not everybody in the room is a Spanish speaker, that somebody is there to interpret. Um, we also have to use plain language. Um, you know, the language that works for that individual is the language that everyone should be speaking. Um, making sure that the individual gets to choose their services and supports. Um, another little tip is that everybody is talking to the individual and not about the individual in front of them. Um, that is one of the hardest things for, for parents. Let me tell you, I'm one of those where I sit there and go, um, well, Joshua really likes to do blah, blah, blah. And when Josh is sitting right next to me, instead of saying, Josh, don't you like to do blah, blah, blah. And so it's, it's, you have to make sure parents out there that you are talking to your child at the person center plan and that you insist that the, the independent facilitator and everybody around them talks directly to that individual. Um, and make sure you have follow-up plans. That's one of the biggest problems. You have this person center planning meeting and there's no follow-up and nothing ever gets done. Please don't be um, uh, seduced by an independent facilitator who tells you that they're going to make your person center plan look really beautiful. Because uh, my son loves Disneyland. And so he, his, very, his first person center plan was so gorgeous. It was a Disneyland map where he went to Frontierland and Tomorrowland and everything and Fantasyland and all these great things. It was beautifully designed and not a single thing got implemented because there was no follow-up to the plan. His current plan is a type sheet of paper, like two, two or three pages, and most of it has been implemented. So it's all about making sure that someone is assigned to follow up with every single piece of that person center plan. Um, remember that it's about, it's first about your dreams and goals. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about this. Your person center plan is not your IPP. It's your person center plan is not a list of services. It's your hopes and dreams, some of which cost money and some of which doesn't. My son for that Disneyland person center plan, one of the things that came out was he wanted to spend more time with his grandpa. But grandpa, that the goal of spending more time with grandpa is, is not an IPP goal. That would be weird to go in an IPP. It was more appropriate to go in his person center plan. And by the way, it was free. That was a free thing. But that's what one of the great results that came out of that person center plan. And as Connie Lapin says, it's not about what's available. It's about what's possible. And one of the things that regional centers who've been living in the world of what's available is that they can't think outside the box to what's possible. So you have a child who says, I want to be a filmmaker. And it's like, that's so great. You want to be a filmmaker. I don't want to hear from the, from people, his teacher, the regional center. That is so unlikely that he's ever going to become a filmmaker. Let's figure out what's possible. So, so let's get them into some classes. Let's have them buy a camera and make some movies. And then we'll figure out what's really possible. Um, I, I I'm going to just go through this super fast. It's critically important you do pre-planning. If you have a good independent facilitator, they should already know pre-planning is required. Um, when you are looking for an independent facilitator, you should ask them what is part of your pre-planning process. This is this is not actually creating your goals, but it is like who do you want at your meeting? When and where do you want it? Um, what don't you want to bring up? I can promise you my son does not like a group of people sitting around and saying all the bad things about him. Who would want that? I would never want to have a meeting where everybody talked about all the bad things I do. 
So anything that's negative is off the table. When we're, of course, at a person center plan, you should be talking strength based anyway. But, you know, should my son get more exercise? Let's talk about it in a positive way, as opposed to saying you need to lose weight. So I think that there, it has to be a positive format um, and get things off the table. Um, you know, what, what accommodations are going to be needed? Um, you know, what, how do we make sure your culture is appreciated and honored at your PCP, at the PCP? Um, at the actual meeting, I love to say this, this is, this is um, uh, what's how Sally Purton Hoyle calls a person-centered planning meeting is a party with a purpose. A party with a purpose, it, it's got to have a, a festive, festive atmosphere. It, um, I can tell you, I went to a person center plan for um, the son of our co-founders, Elizabeth and Fernando, and they, they, they called it a fiesta. And it was so beautiful. And it was so great to, to, to hear everybody celebrate the individual. I mean, one of my favorite questions that gets things opening up is, what surprises you about this person? And everybody goes around the room and talks about how they know that individual and what surprises them about, about, um, about what, what is surprising about them. And so it, you want it to be a great experience. And I've never been to a person-centered plan where the individual at the center and directing it is not completely thrilled to be there. So it, 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 they understand that people are there to honor them. Um, there should be rules laid out at the beginning. Um, the independent facilitators should be telling everyone to direct their comments and questions to the to the to the person. Um, the participant directs the meeting as much as they possibly can, um, and that oh, I talked about that. Sorry, comments to be made to the participant, and that notes need to be kept and timelines made for follow up. Um, so I want to, I'm going to go tag back and forth with Molly on this. Um, so why is that person-centered plan so important for, for you? Um, so I want you to remember that the person-centered plan is not about services. When you get done with your person-centered plan, you, you shouldn't say the only place I'm sending it to is my regional sensor, because then you've kind of wasted this great opportunity. You should be giving your person-centered plan to your doctors, your therapists, your friends, your, your employers, if you're your teachers, the IEP team, everybody in your life should get a copy of this because that's a way for them to know what's important to you and what's important for you and how you've made choices in your life. So therefore, I, I was I was on a, a meeting this morning with the Independent Facilitators Network, a great group. But one of the questions came out was like, oh, I was going to put in, in the person-centered plan all the service codes in the traditional system of services they receive. And I said, you know, that's not really a person-centered plan. That's a good maybe an addendum, but an added thing that could be extremely useful to get you maybe if you if you have unmet need. But your person-centered plan should be your dream board. It should be everything you want to do in your life and how you're going to get there. And some of the things, some of the ways you're going to be getting there cost money. Some of the ways you're going to be getting there can be paid for by self-determination. And some of it is free and some of it can't be paid for by self-determination. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't have those dreams and goals. One of the things you can do is figure out if self-determination can't pay. For that, then let's figure out who can if you can't afford it yourself. So I'm going to have you, Molly, go to the sort of bottom part of this chart about how the person center plan influences the self determination program. So the the main part that you will really use for the creating your IPP and new services and support that lead into your funding plan are the goals that you develop that relate to things that impact your disability and can be supported by your the, the uh, funds in your funding plan. Well, I forgot to click to your thing. Go ahead. Yeah, so go go ahead. Sorry, Molly. So when you're looking at the goals that you develop, 
and you figure out which ones you think can be part of your IPP because when you do a self-determination plan, you do a brand new IEP and the, the goals that you want in them should be taken from your present center plan. And they should relate to the services and support you need, whether they're paid for or not, but you want to make sure if you need them to be paid for, they really reflect the goal. Because if they don't reflect the goal, say, I, well, Judy, you're good at this. What kind of goal, how would you write the goal so you reflect how you can pay for things? Yeah, so um, that's actually in, an, in another slide. So we'll get to that. Okay, <laughs> so this is the, the most important thing is to have your goals because they will be part of your IPP. They will help decide what services you need and support. And then you will, using your spending plan, allocate how much you want to pay within that budget for your services and support. Thank you, Molly. So the, so the person-centered plan, as we have been saying, informs the goals that you have in your IPP. So the goals that you have in your person-centered plan are the universe of goals. So things like my son wanting to spend more time with his grandpa, um, which, which is not necessarily a goal that you would put in your IPP. It might also be an educational goal that if you're still a school age child, K through 12, you, you might have a goal that you, um, you know, get, uh, get more resources for math in school or that you have, um, you make friends during the school day. Those are requirements that a generic resource or the school district should be paying for, but that doesn't mean it shouldn't go into your person-centered plan. Of course, it should be in your person-centered plan, but the regional centers are not allowed to pay for that. The state of California has made it clear that anything related to education needs to be paid for by the educational system um, during your school day. So, um, so, but here's the key thing that I want to get across to everybody is that your goals in the IPP are informed by your person-centered plan. In case people don't know what the IPP is, it's the individual program plan. It's that annual meeting and contract you have with your regional center and the state of California to receive services. And in this case, to receive funding for your self-determination program. Your IPP goals, though, must relate to your disability. Your person-centered planning goals do not. Um, I, I've never given this, I've never said it this way before. Um, and it, the reason I am saying it this way is because I am hearing from the State Department of Developmental Services, from DDS, that they are likely to be coming out with a directive that is going to say that. So. I don't know when that directive is going to come out, but I want all of us to be ahead of the game on this and to know, and it actually makes sense because the goals in your IPP now are related to the things, the supports and services you need because of your disability to live a life in the community that is healthy, safe, and fulfilling, right? So, um, so you know, just... Just saying, you know, I want to have um, an iPad because I, you know, th that that is not enough. That everything you buy has to be related to a goal. And that goal cannot be, I like playing video games. I want to play video games two hours a day because that has nothing to do with the disability. If, if you're using an iPad because you use it to communicate, 
um, and you use it as a tool to help you, you know, integrate into the community, that is, or you use it as a, as for work. Let's say your, your iPad is something you need because uh, of a job you have or a job you want to get, let's say. Okay, these are all goals that normally go into an IPP. So, um, so remember that the services, the activities, the items that you purchase have to, through the self-determination program must relate to your IPP goals and your disability. So I, I'm trying to get you all out ahead of this because I know that, that DDS is likely to come down um, on about concerns about Disneyland passes and Universal Studios passes and some equipment and goods that people are buying that regional centers are complaining it has nothing to do with the person's disability. So I believe in freedom at all costs, that freedom is the most important value here. It's why it's number one. And that if you have money in your budget to purchase certain things that you should have the freedom to do that. However, if you are not making the case that it relates to both an IPP goal and, a dis and your disability, you are going to run into problems. Okay, so, um, so let's go to, I think this is the final one. The goals for your person-centered plan, uh, I, I said that, must also relate to the way you're spending the money in your uh, spending plan. Um, so just as kind of a summary of your PCP goals, your PCP goals should be written clearly and reflect the supports, activities, and items that you need to achieve those goals. So when I say clearly, they should not, they don't need to look like your IEPs where you say, um, I will uh, greet the, per, the teacher when I walk in the door 80% of the time and three out of five tries. Like that is not a real, that's not the way real people live. But your goals can be things like improving your interpersonal communication. Um, uh, get, ha, in, in, how about increasing your, your circle of support? To getting more unpaid people in your life and friends and or maybe building a, a romantic relationship. So these are goals that you can put in your person center plan. You can have timelines with them if you want, you don't have to, but those are the kinds of, of goals that you want to make sure to say, these are goals that relate to my disability. The reason why I haven't been able to make a lot of friends is because I have, I, you know, I need to learn some of the etiquette skills that I didn't naturally get as a child. So maybe I, you know, that, that is something that I'd really like to learn. And then naturally that goes into having a goal about making more friends in, in your IPP. And so if that is something related to your disability, you could put that in your IPP and then lay out specifically how those goals are being met by that purchase, whether that, that's a purchase of a staff member, a purchase of, an, of a good or, or a purchase of an activity. So let's say you want to go to Disneyland. I think it's going to be really hard for you to get it now. Honestly, I had a big debate on it. It's going to be hard in the future. But the way you would make the case of Disneyland is not to say Disneyland is my happiest place on earth and I want to go there at least once a month. So therefore, I want to buy an annual pass. That is great to put in your person center plan, but that has nothing to do with your disability. That's, there's lots of people who love Disneyland and want an annual pass, me being one of them. But what you have to say is, what, what are goals that you could meet? Um, so you, I guess I want to say it this way. Don't back into your goals by saying, well, I really want to make sure the self-determination program pay, pays for the Disneyland pass. So I'm going to back into a goal. It, everything, every goal you have should arise organically at your person-centered plan out of the, 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 the dreams and hopes that you're hearing from that individual and their support team. So um, if, if it comes up naturally that this person has, um, that, that 
that this person wants to be part of a club and maybe there's a Disneyland club at their school where a bunch of people go to Disneyland once a month. And that's a real big desire of that individual to be part of that club because they also meet during the week at school and they want to, you want to be friends with these, you know, neurotypical kids, whatever it is. And the only way you can be part of this club is to be able to afford a Disneyland pass. That to me, that's a goal. You want to be part of this club. There we go. A Disneyland pass. But if you're just saying, well, we get, we, we walk a lot of steps at Disneyland, you know, you could walk a lot of steps by walking through your neighborhood. So that alone is not going to do it for you. So you have to really make the case that that purchase, that item, that activity is really um, supporting you as a person with a disability to be able to reach your, your goals that are appropriate goals that go in an IPP. So I hope that wasn't too confusing. I know that, um, that you may have a lot of questions. I've been seeing lots of chat coming in. I haven't read any of them. But if you want to ask a question about this or about anything else that's related to the self-determination program, now is your chance. And Molly and others and I will do our best to answer your questions. Um, if you would like to answer, ask a question um, verbally, you can go down to reactions and click on raise hand, um, or you can ask it in the chat. So Ed, I'm going to start with you because I've seen like tons of things in the chat. Certainly. So the first question I have is, I have a question, an anonymous question. If you could please ask anonymously, can regional centers deny services or items that are needed and are not covered by uh, other agencies? The items that are requested are to meet IPP goals and are on the person-centered plan. And this person said that they uh, received um, a budget with their items, with some items removed. Well, I would really need to know why they're claiming that you can't purchase them. So there is going to be in the next month or hopefully sooner, a um, a directive that's going to be coming from the Department of Developmental Services, which will actually list the things you cannot purchase. Um, some of them will be very specific and some of them will be types of things. So specific things I can tell you that are definitely going to be on the list are rent, rent for a place or mortgage for a house, um, food, you cannot buy food with it. These are things that are prohibited because of the um, the federal government, and you're supposed to use generic resources like SSI for that. Um, the other thing that's going to be prohibited, I'm certain, is um, changing, re uh, redoing your home that has nothing to do with your disability. So you are allowed to do things with your home like widen the doorways so that a wheelchair can go in and out, putting bars in your bathroom. Um, those kinds of things in your home, you cannot put in a swimming pool in your backyard, you cannot um, e even, even basic things I think that relate to improving your home that is unrelated to your disability are going to be turned down. Um, even though regional centers are not, don't have an approval, um, the, the DDS is going to tell them that those are prohibited um, purchases. Um, there, there is still debate on how they're going to tackle their concerns about Disneyland passes. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll have to see how that goes. But I guess for this anonymous questioner, Ed, I would really need to know what the item is and what the um, and what their reasoning was, because there's lots of things, by the way, regional centers are um, claiming are not approved expenses when that's not true. So I would need to more know more specifics. Got it. Thank you, Judy. I'll let you know if I get them. Um, I have from Sue Gavin, what about when you don't have multiple people in your life um, willing or able to be part of your person-centered plan? Mm -hmm. um, and our, our uh, outreach director, Rachel, responded uh, with some great information. Um, and Sue clarified that her concern is that it's most likely to be just her at the person-centered plan, I'm assuming for her child. Um, and what happens when she can't be that person? Yeah, so a major goal of your child's I, uh, PCP should be to increase your circle of support. 
Everybody needs a large circle of support. Um, I, you are not the only one. I've heard this for years where people say, I have no one to bring to my, my PCP meeting. Um, and, and I have to tell you that if you have a really good independent facilitator, they're going to help draw out who some of those people might be. I'm going to give you an example that Sally Burton Hoyle talks about when she does trainings. She was doing a person-centered plan for a man who didn't, who had a very small circle of support. Um, he lived in a home where every day he, he had no job, he went nowhere, but he would go by himself. I guess he was independent enough to walk down the street and back. And he would walk down to the corner and he would stare at this auto mechanics place, you know, place where they fix cars. And they all knew him there and he would wave to them. And it came out during the pre-planning pre -planning process that he was very interested in cars and that maybe someday he would like to work at a place like that auto mechanics. So his independent facilitator, who was Sally, drove down to the auto mechanics store, introduced herself and said, you know, that man that you're always seeing waving to you, comes in and views you, said, oh yeah, he's a nice guy. She said, he's doing a person-centered plan. This is a passion he has, his cars. Would you be willing to come to his person-centered plan? And lo and behold, this man said, of course, she said, we'll feed you meal, a meal. He shows up and he offers a, an, uh, you know, an, an unpaid sort of apprenticeship for this man. And eventually this man got a job working there. And so these are the things that you need to think about is that the people at your person-centered plan don't have to be your best friends. They don't have to be, you know, your immediate relatives. They can be people who can get you your goals. And so that's where your independent facilitator really has to help you think outside the box about what it is you, um, what, what kinds of people can come in. And what a, what a great answer to that, Judy, because it leads into our next question from Shirley. How do you find an independent facilitator? Yeah. Yes, that is a question we have gotten a lot. Um, there are lists around. I don't believe in lists because lists look just looks just like the traditional system. Um, and so I don't believe in lists, but there are lots of lists. Um, I, the one um, th I know that if you're in the Southern California area, there the state council has a list of independent facilitators who just put their names in. I know that there is a website that's been created um, by the FMS uh, called Public Partnerships that also lists like 150 independent facilitators. But uh, we we don't advertise a list. Here's what I would recommend is that um, go to your local advisory committee at your regional center. If you are seeing independent facilitators showing up there, then they are probably great people because that means they're staying involved and they understand how the program works. I have to be honest with you. I have seen some really bad person center plans out there. And I have heard some independent facilitators screwing things up royally for some participants. So you have to be really careful. This is a very new program. I can guarantee you that the vast majority of independent facilitators out there have done fewer than 10 person centered plans. And sometimes they've only done a small handful. So you want to be asking them questions. How many person centered plans have you done? And each of you will get up to $2,500 for the planning process and moving into the program and all that kind of stuff. You do not want to be using $2,500 to develop a person-centered plan. It should, I can tell you that we had one done from a highly experienced of 30 years person-centered planner, and it costs like $500. So you should not be, because I can guarantee that most of the people you're hiring are highly inexperienced. That doesn't mean that they're not good, but what it means is that they should be offering you something that's a reasonable cost. So you're saving the rest of that $2,500 budget for things like helping to develop the person, send, the, the spending plan, sorry, and also helping to move forward with, um, with advocacy in case you need a change in your budget or somebody needs to advocate for you on your spending plan. Um, and if you don't use all $2,500, that's great. That's the responsibility piece of, this, of the principles of self-determination. So you don't have to spend all the money. That's not your job. 
Your job is to meet your, your hopes and dreams and figure out how to do it in a responsible way as, as long as you have the freedom to do it. So I'm going to, um, Ed, if it's okay with you, I'm going to call on Sarah. I just asked you to unmute to ask your question. Hi. Um, I'm not sure whether this program is um, for my son. I have a um, 25-year-old son with autism. He is what I call, he has a severe autism. Um, it's a self-induced behavior, just um, very um, severe sensory issues. So any group setting is very difficult for him. So he finished the school in non-public setting with a one-on-one -on -one aid. Um, we, after school, he went to one, only one day program I could have possibly um, place him because they had a big building and a lot of small rooms. He didn't like it, um, but they closed down anyway, they were losing money. And those community-based programs, he just cannot do. And his another big issue is he's a um, eloper. So day programs and group homes are kind of out of question because I have all my windows and doors locked. Mm -hmm. And listening to you, um, you said all the, the person center planning, it has to, the community inclusion, he just has a difficult time doing any kind of group activity. Right. So, <laughs> so I don't know if is it a good I, I'm so excited for this question, Sarah, because oh. group activities are the opposite of community inclusion. So I really think self-determination is perfect for your son because he oh. will, if he chooses never to be in a group again, and it's perfect. You should know for my son, he hates groups too. And when he got out of high school at 18, he didn't graduate. We got him out. You can do that, people. It is possible. Um, we got him out of, out of high school. He was offered these horrible segregated group programs where he, he walked in one minute and he was running out the door. And so I never call people elopers. I call them, they are going towards something they'd rather be at. They are, yeah. run, they are either running away from something that's very uncomfortable or they're running towards something that they prefer. So I think your son is a great candidate because what you could do with self-determination is take the funding and hire a one-to-one -one aid, figure out where your son, he can help you, tell you in however way he communicates, what are, what are the things he loves to do? Whether it is going to the park, whether he loves to go to the mall. These are both things that my son hates, by the way. My son <laughs> loves Disneyland and my son loves walking in neighborhoods. That's like one of his favorite things is to go to different neighborhoods, see the houses. He loves driving around in a car. So these are the things that you got to figure out for your own son what he loves to do. And then you hire the staff to make it happen. I, I actually think he's the perfect person for, for the self-determination program. And I really hope you stay with us and, and pursue it for him. But, but I want to tell you that the way it's going to be really important for the future, that the way you describe him is the opposite of the way you described him here. So you started with, he's a very, he has severe autism. He's, he's self-injurious. These are all very important things. And so obviously the way that you provide supports and services must take all of those things into account. But at the same time, you need to start with the positive to say, these are the things that he loves to do. These are the things I love about him. And then let's build on those things. Because maybe one of the reasons why he's having some of these issues is because he's put into situations where his sensory system is overwhelmed. And so we have to keep him out of that sensory system to, to places where he wants to be, where he is happy. So Molly, did you want to add? Go ahead. No. Oh, sorry. Um, so it's... It is, uh, it is, this is such a great opportunity for you, Sarah, and for your, what's your son's name? David. David, for David, because I think that, um, you know, you have to figure out, you have to get the right independent facilitator who really understands um, the issues that he's facing and the challenges that he'll face to be able to fully participate in the community. But when I say fully participate in the community, I mean the opposite of a day program. It's living in the life like a person without a disability lives. And so that means that if he loves to go to the movies, damn it, he should get to go to the movies as much as he likes. You know, whatever, if he likes to go to church, he, we should make sure he's at church. And if he has some sensory issues around wherever place he is, but he still wants to be there, let's figure out how to accommodate that. So my son loves libraries, but he's always very loud. And so we found libraries where we could talk to the librarian to say, is it okay? He wants to come here, but he talks all the time. He, 
He doesn't really talk like fluidly. He's usually reciting like a SpongeBob episode, but still they were like, yeah, hell yeah, bring him. We'd love to have him. And so th those are the things you, you, you have a facilitator who helps you find those great opportunities for him. So stay with us. I Thank hope you you'll join. All right. Um, Christina, how are you? Thank you, Judy. Uh, Johnny is here with me too. And we each have um, a, a question. So I'll let Johnny you can go first. Can you ask Judy a question and Molly? Hey, Johnny. I like to go out and listen to music and bands. Some of them are at bars. Does that matter? Um, no, as a matter of fact, I don't know if everyone heard, but he said, I like, Johnny said, I like to go out to hear music and go to, and some of this, it, it said bars. And is that matter? Well, Johnny's over 21, right? So if Johnny's over 21, he can go to a bar. I have to tell you that my son goes to bars because my son hates children. One of my, it's not that he hates children. My son cannot stand the sound of babies crying. That is like a sensory issue he has. So we've realized once he turned 21, the going to bars is like the best possible place for him to go. To hear bands at bars is the best possible place. And so he has an aide who will take him there. Um, and it, it, it works great. So Johnny, maybe, maybe you and my son can go to a bar together and listen to a band. Let's make this happen. Did you have a, oh, do you need to unmute again? Do you have another question for you? There you are. Now we, yeah, sorry. you're unmuted. Yeah, sorry, I muted. Um, so thank you for that. And yes, that mm -hmm. would be great because Johnny's not a big fan of little babies or little kids either. So, yeah. um, okay. So with regards, going off of that, mm -hmm. one of the challenges we're, we're trying to figure out is, um, when there are things like, you know, we don't know when a music uh, band might be playing at a bar. So in terms of putting that in um, the budget, because it, is there a way to have things that are not pre-planned? You know, like I know we, in, in terms of like a, a couple weeks ahead of time, but where would it fit into like going into uh, music or things that we, you know, we're kind of also ex doing some career exploration. I really, have, right? We don't really have any idea as to what you like to do um, in terms of maybe volunteering or working at a at a job. And so, mm -hmm. the first year, are there suggestions that um, you or Molly or anyone has mm -hmm. about how to word that in the um, first year plan? So, so why do you feel you need to put something in the spending plan about? going to a bar to your music is it the admission cost correct to purchase tickets for the ah, okay okay the you, right mm -hmm. yeah so you can't remember you can't purchase any food or drink at a bar with self-determination right so what you see one of the issues with this honestly is you'd have to find the one place you don't have to give dates or anything but you have to find the one place that's willing to bill your fms for those admission costs because you cannot be reimbursed so that honestly is going to be a little bit complicated um you know it's it's a little bit easier if you say okay we're getting a subscription to this place where we know it's one cost mm -hmm. and here and please at, at fms purchase the subscription for these 10 concerts that is very different than at, at, at a moment's notice next friday we're going to go hear a band i think that's going to be a lot harder um so i i would look at you know is there something that you could negotiate with a bar to say listen we want to buy tickets admission tickets for all of your bands for the year how much can we negotiate a cost we're not sure we're going to come we're not sure but it might be a hundred bucks to come 10 times can can we do that okay. and i am and and here i would get a check and it would be mailed to you we would do it in advance you're going to have to find somebody who's pretty cool about it but um i think you could make that happen because they won't deal in cash for sure the fmss Right. Okay. And to get something ahead of time, like for them to pay for the ticket, if we send them the link, that's not really. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's, I guess it is possible. I guess that's possible. I would, um, and that's certainly the way you would do it if it were in um, mm -hmm. uh, a, a subscription, but I think 
when you put it in your spending plan, like this unknown thing, we're not sure how many or, or, or what it's going to cost each time, I think you might get some pushback. So I would start with negotiating with a place that you know has really good bands and seeing how you can negotiate some and, and make sure that this is part of his goals, remember? So just going to a bar to listen to music has nothing to do with your disability, Johnny, it has nothing to do with that. Anybody could want to do that. And so it, you have to tie it to the disability. Like maybe he has a group of friends that all go together and this is a social activity for you together. Okay. So, so remember, it has to be tied to that goal and just going to bar is no different than going to Disneyland in the eyes of DDS. Right. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Judy. Thank you. Sure. Um, Miriam, how you doing? Am I unmuted? Oh, there you are. You did it. You got it. I actually wanted to just, the person who uh, didn't think they'd ha be able to get many people to their PCP, I wanted to give them, I thought the same thing. And so I wanted to just let them know who I had in mind so that that might help them kind of think a little out of the box. Um, uh, the only family member we have is uh, the grandmother. She was there. Uh, well, there when I say ours was Zoom because it's been during COVID. Um, and that actually helped things out, by the way, um, if doing it by Zoom. But um, we had both of his, um, he's in high school. We had both of his aides who have been with him since fourth grade and he's going into 11th. They were both there um, and we had a, a family friend now who is a parent of another child with Down syndrome that we've known since they were little babies. Um, she was there, I, told, I sold her on it by saying, hey, would you wanna be there because it'll help you understand a little more because they're still on the fence with self-determination. And um, it was amazing because um, I, I was able to find people from different kind of places. Like, so the people that saw him at school were able to bring out other positive things about him that I kind of didn't know. And, um, and so I just wanted to kind of give those ideas because I really thought I was gonna have two of us. <laughs> yeah, that is, those are great suggestions, Miriam. I love it. I mean, it's, you have to think outside the box of, of who can be there and, yeah. Um, and, and it concerns me that people think, and I, I've heard this a lot, that they think that they only have a few people in their lives. And so that should be obviously a goal to expand. Uh, there's something called natural supports. The natural support is actually in the Lanterman Act. So you are required to have natural supports, even though the regional centers do nothing to actually help you get more natural supports. But natural supports are those people who are in your life who are not paid um, to be in your life. Um, so they are... The first natural support is usually the parents, the immediate family. They're often, you know, extended family like cousins, and they're often friends of the family. Oh, and, I forgot one big one. Yeah, go ahead. Um, our, uh, sorry, um, she was the biggest one. She used to be our ABA person, and once she left the company, she became our respite person. Um, respite people are really, really, really good. If, you, if you're close enough with them, and it's not just a random person on, on call, um, they have so much information too. That was my, uh, sorry, didn't interrupt. That's great. That's perfect. That's so wonderful. Um, all right. So Ed, back to you. Thanks, Miriam. It's great to see you. You doing you okay? Yeah. You doing okay? Excellent. Yeah, good. Awesome. awesome. Um, so go ahead, Ed, with the next question. Sure thing. I have a great question from Julio. I haven't heard this one before. Can you buy a new car to drive with your plan? If, mm -hmm. if it relates to a goal in your now? Yeah, you cannot. Thank you for that question, Julio, because remember how I said there are going to be some very specific things you cannot do? That is going to be in that list the DDS is putting out. You cannot buy a new car. You cannot pay a lease on a car. What you can do is if you already own a car, you can modify that car to put a wheelchair ramp in it or to change the steering wheel in order to make it work for you because of your disability. So, but you are definitely not gonna be able to buy a car. Um, can you fix your car, the general upkeep of the car? The answer is no. Um, so anything that is sort of related generally to a car that has nothing to do with your disability, you cannot do. 
but you can pay for Uber and you can pay for Lyft and you can pay for a taxi. So think about that as well. Thank you, Judy. I have a question from Danielle. I was doing an SDP budget meeting with, S with San Diego Regional Center and they were telling the parent that it's based on the next 12 months, that the budget I think is based on the next 12 months, not the prior 12 months. Mm -hmm. and that their ABA therapy was not included in the, in the budget, et cetera. Once I chimed in and asked if I should call DDS for further training for them, they stated that we could reconvene and I requested the prior 12 month expenditure and finally they gave it. This is very concerning. They're not telling parents the truth and they're not following the process properly. Uh, Judy, can you reach out about this? This is the third parent that I've had to intervene for. Um, what regional center was that again, Ed? San Diego Regional Center. That's so weird because I, I just met the head of the San Diego Regional Center Self-Determination Program and Molly knows her well. Um, Molly's at San Diego. Do you have any suggestions, Molly? Well, again, I think each coordinator is maybe saying things differently. I know that most of the coordinators there have go to one training daily of over 500 people. So, but if if you could email me, I could send it on to Susie mm. and see what happens. Yes, there's a woman named Susie who's the head of the self-determination program who seems to me and Molly to be really good. So this might be a situation where Service coordinators are making up their own rules. Um, this is really quite problematic because the law is very clear that it's based on your last 12 months of services. Um, so, yeah. I need to go. To Thank you, Molly. Thanks, Molly. I will see, we'll see you soon. Um, Elizabeth Cuevas, go ahead. Hi. Um, I think Julio was probably... Um, thinking of a scenario that I had heard also at uh, one of the trainings back, uh, I don't know, 2017 or something from my regional center of, a, of a, a client and what you could possibly do with your money. And probably things have changed from then, but uh, they shared a scenario of a, of a person with a disability who enjoyed riding in cars and drinking coffee and needed to make a living. So she decided she was going to use her money to purchase a car and that was good. She was gonna be an Uber, but she was gonna have a driver that she was gonna pay. Right. She was gonna ride in the car and that was going to be her income and her business. So in that example, you know, she did buy the car with the SDP money, but is it different now? That was when, when was back. when did that happen, Elizabeth? I don't know. It was an example that was shared with us. Yeah, th that might have been from the pilot. So okay. everybody should know that the pilot project was loosey goosey. Um, half the people in the pilot were doing things that probably wouldn't be approved under the self determination program, and the other half of the people were being in super segregated day programs, which also wouldn't be approved. So there's been, some, and, and then there's, you know, a group that stayed the same, but um, the pilot was was not receiving federal money. So the regulations on the federal stuff, um, it was really, really different. So yeah, okay. I have a Thank feeling you. that has changed and nobody should really try to get a car with the self-determination program. It's, it's gonna get, it's for sure DDS will say no. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, go ahead, Ed, with another question. I was muted. Apologies, folks. Uh, so next question uh, from Patty. Um, my son does not have friends. His, his friends are all the players he met at ping pong club where he plays. Respectfully, Patty, it sounds like he does have friends. Um, <laughs> can this be a request that deals with his disability uh, because he just does not have skills to make friends. I will add, just because this is related, Patty mentions um, she's not sure if, um, if if the folks that her son's, if his ping pong buddies like know that he has autism. Mm -hmm. And so she's not sure how one would go about inviting them. And I'm, I would say my suggestion would be have your son 
invite yeah. them. If yeah, definitely, definitely for that. Um, you know, if if you are an individual who ha is having problems making friends, keeping friends, having a relationship, keeping a relationship, um, those are all absolutely goals that are related to your disability. And they and you want to make sure to identify what your hopes and dreams are that you want to have friends. Um, not everybody wants to have friends. So you want to identify that that's actually something in the person centered planning process that you want. And then, um, then you want to make sure there's a goal like that in your IPP to have more friends. And then what are the services and supports that you need to make sure you can have more friends? And those are the things you pay for through the self-determination program. Got it. Thank you, Judy. I have a question from Jenny. I was under the impression that including the service codes in the self-determination program was a helpful way of clarifying things for regional center and making the transition process easier. Did I hear you say not to include service codes and budget estimates in the self-determination program or the person-centered plan? Yeah, I, I wouldn't put it in the person-centered plan. I mean, that is not a true authentic person-centered plan if it's all about services and service codes. Um, that doesn't mean you shouldn't have an addendum to your person-centered plan that talks about those things. But a person-centered plan is something you should be able to hand to anybody in your life. You can walk into your doctor's office and say, you know what? I did something called a person-centered plan. It talks all about my hopes and dreams. I want you to have it and put it in my file. Or you could go to your school and say, here's my person-centered plan. Because in there, it also has my hopes and dreams for my education. So if it has all these service codes in it, like why would your doctor want to look at it? Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't have a separate document if you feel it will be helpful for you. I can tell you, I never had any of those documents. It is not our job to know service codes. It is the job of the regional centers. The regional centers just got an additional $7.8 million on top of the $2 million they already had to implement the self-determination program at the regional center. So you heard me, they now have $10 million a year. Every year, they will get $10 million to implement the self-determination program. And so if they are now putting on us that we have to know the right service code, what are they doing? So we need to have what's in our plan and what's in our spending plan that is related to our goals and let them figure out what the right service code is. I know they keep dumping this on you or they're dumping it on the independent facilitator or on the, I, uh, on the FMS, but that is not our jobs. That is the job of the regional center and always has been. So let's, let's start laying down the law here and not bending over backwards and having them do what they need to do. And there is no way that they're gonna come out and say, there is no service code for what you want if all of your services and goods and, and items and activities are related to your disability. There's no way they will definitely be able to find a service code that relates to it, okay? Thank you, Judy. One second, I just wanna finish this question that I am answering in the chat. Okay. You know what, then I'm gonna go to Carl real quick, if that's Please okay. Do. Please do. Okay. Hey, Carl, go ahead and unmute, Carl. Oh, you were, I feel like you were frozen, Carl. Oh, just at this moment, he froze. Okay, so go ahead, Ed. Okay, great. I just finished it, so now <laughs> I can continue. Um, sorry, I lost my place. Jan says, I am late to the party. What can I quote to the regional center that they cannot approve spending plans? It's gotten more strict at Inland Regional Center. I, I just unmuted Jan. Do you want to expand on that? Yeah, even, I, I can just use my daughter as an example. So they're like, oh, no, you can't. She's doing horseback riding. You put in um, boots and a helmet. Nope, you can't put the boots in a helmet. This is for my spending plan for her second year. So, yeah, they're nitpicking. Oh, you put in, there was another thing I put in that was similar. It was interperson center plan. It was, you know, appropriate. It was part of a class. Nope, you can't do that either. And what is the reasoning? Because we don't want everyone else to ask for stuff like that. Okay. Well, that is not a reason. That is not a no. legitimate reason. Uh, I just heard a reason for my regional center where he said, he said to a parent, oh, you're just trying to get your kid ahead in life oh. by putting them in a class, a special class. And it's like, okay, that is not a reason at all. And so 
Um, remember that everything you're asking for has to be tied to the disability, right? So if this, if, if they could potentially make a legitimate argument that getting a helmet and, and re regular helmet and regular boots is not tied to her disability. So if she needs some sort of special equipment to be able to access horseback riding, that is related to her disability. So you really want to stick with that as much as possible. I just, I, I wish I didn't have to say this to you all. I really didn't. I, I really wish that we had freedom. We don't have freedom. DDS is about to come down and tell us you have a little bit of freedom, not a lot of freedom. So I want to try to make sure that everybody is trying to get as much as they can, um, you know, in their spending plan, but by relating it to your disability. So my son is participating in a special program where it is um, he, he it's people with disabilities who are providing community service to senior citizens who live in in a convalescent home or something. And it's like that we want the admission fee paid for that. I had to argue for that. I had to say, yeah, he would not be able to do regular volunteer work. There's no way that we could sign him up to just go in and help people because he doesn't follow directions. He doesn't listen. He constantly is singing loud. It's like, that's not going to work for him. So being part of this special community service program, which costs money to be part of, as opposed to usually volunteer service, you don't pay anything. You just do it. But being part of this is because it's the only way he can actually volunteer is to be able to have these kinds of supports to do it. And so it was approved. So remember, always tie it to the disability and you're going to have a lot easier time. And so there's nothing in the law, right, that states anything about approving these spending no. plans. No, the spending they plans They can't approve approved. them No, either way. They, they do not approve the spending plan. They review it and they can only review it for three reasons. Number one, it's a service that's paid for by the federal government. So that's where you're gonna get the big nose on rent and cars and food. And number two, is it, can you pay for it with a generic resource like the school district or your insurance? And three, is it is it fully integrated into the community? And so those are the things that they're supposed to review and kick back to you. Not cost effectiveness, not is this the cheapest thing you could buy, um, but I can just, so even though it doesn't say it in the law, there will be a directive that's going to come out in the next month that will have something saying it must, the expenses must be related to your disability. I just know, okay. it. Mm. I just know it. Yep. That's where they're going. I, I, we've only had one meeting on it, but I saw the writing mm. on the law on the wall. And I said, let does, let us make sure that everybody knows this. Lots of things, by the way, are related to your disability. It's like, it shouldn't be that hard. Lots of things are related to your disability. Um, but, you know, primarily what people are, are what you're going to have the easiest time, honestly, getting, getting through the system without a major crisis is, um, is when you're purchasing staff costs, you're hiring staff to take you into the community because there's no way they can argue against that. Because if you are a 24 year old, like my son, who, who is not safe to be in the community by himself, cannot drive, cannot manage public transportation, he absolutely must have someone with him at all times. So there's just like never any questions about those things. So you wanna make sure that that integration piece is about providing the support to be able to do those things in the community that you wouldn't normally be able to do without support. It's not necessarily to pay to go to the movies. It's about the, it's about you wanting to go to the movies as a, as a person without a disability would do and here are the supports you need to go to the movies. Okay, all right, Thanks. sure. Hey, Carl, you're back. You froze for a second. Uh, yes, internet problems. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, not a problem. Great. Okay, three brief things. First of all, my oldest son is beginning his second year on self-determination. Please, you parents who are here, you must, you must bring your children into self-determination. My son has had the best years of his life on self-determination. But that's not why I want, that's not the comment I wanted to make, Judy. So there's a parent here whose son 
wanted to go to bars, listen to music. So when my son was receiving regional center services, he wanted to go to strippers. And so dad was worried, what goes on inside those? Because I don't play on that team. So I went for the first time in my life, I went over to one of those strip joints. And what I saw was those topless girls treating my son in the most loving, caring, sensitive way. It was beautiful. And there, it was my son's only opportunity to be around women mm -hmm. and topless women at that. Mm -hmm. And this was when we were regional, using, having regional center services, and they took this matter to litigation, claiming that we were bringing him to prostitutes. <laughs> oh, now, my God. <laughs> now we are on self-determination. And, you know, my son goes wherever he wants to go, period. It is his life and it is his choice. So uh, the last thing, Judy, is I posted my latest blog post in chat, Thank and you. I would like to ask to look at it. Oh, so you, I'm excited Judy. about it. I'm going to click on it right now, Carl. Thank you. Thank you. Always great to see you. Um, please don't tell my son about the stripper thing, because it'll be the only thing he ever wants to do every single day of his life. So we would have to have a whole sort of plan about that first, guaranteed. <laughs> Ed, do you have some more questions? I sure do. I have a question from Jay. I would like to ask Judy if it is okay to add the goal um, about like a special needs car seat in to regional center, I'm assuming in, in an IPP for the safety of our son. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. That is related to the disability. It keeps them safe. You could also put, if you want an extra walker, an extra wheelchair, you know, all those things that as long as you've exhausted insurance, um, insurance would never pay for a car seat, I don't think. So I think you're good with that. Great. Thank you, Judy. I have a question from Candy. Can you please ask Judy if you can participate in the internship program and be in self-determination. Candy, you might have to yeah. clarify. Yes. No, I know what she means. Oh, yeah. Good. Okay. Great. Yeah. So it, I think you mean the paid, mean the paid internship program. Um, so that is outside of the self-determination program. And the answer is definitely yes. You should know that Molly, who you heard present is in the self-determination program and also is in the paid internship program working for us. So, um, so you should know that it, the answer is hundred percent. Yes. Awesome. Thank you very much, Judy. Um, so I'm going to do two things. I'm going to pop in the chat um, a question that is in Spanish that I would like Lorna uh, to translate from Maribel. Um, Lorna, if you can do that now, that's fine. If not, let me know. I can. I, I, I have All right, so idea. while Lorna's looking at that, Connie had her hand up. All right, it's Harvey and you know, Connie. Yeah, it's the, Harvey. OK. Listen, you know, we leave out of the conversation why there are advisory committees at the regional centers. And the bottom line is there probably are good ones, bad ones, and in between ones. But some of this stuff that you feel is a violation, uh, they have to be informed because they were put there for oversight. We forget about that. And to do training. And, and training. It's not, but training is not the only thing. It's oversight. Right. And the bottom line, this just proves to me another thing. You need a competent, competent facilitator. So I, I just want to say one thing really quick. This is an amazing discussion. And Judy, yeah. you're doing a great job. And, and it, it is critical. The person-centered plan is critical. What I worry about, and I have a very scientific term, is that with the regional centers and even at DDS, they mush the person-centered plan with the IPPs. So IPPs could be called person-family-centered planning IPPs or person-centered okay. IPPs. But we, this is so critical for self-determination to be successful is to understand the PCP. I hear families and people saying, who am I going to invite to my um, uh, person-centered plan? 
unpaid friends are the hardest things in the world. It should be maybe the most important goal when you enter school. How do you get an unpaid friend? But it's really important to know the difference. And um, we, I, I, I was waiting for you to say it, Judy, you didn't, I'll say it very quickly. We own the PCP. We don't own the IPP, and, and that says it all. And I, we only have a few and, more minutes. And one of the big things that can come out of self-determination is connecting with the organizations community. and com the community and friends. This is a dream. This is a dream that we can dream about. This is something that, you know, I don't, you know, I keep saying to you, I'm too old, I'm crying all the time now. But the bottom line is, this is our shot at life. Yeah. Everybody, if you don't, if you've never met Connie and Harvey, they're the reason why we have a self-determination law in California. So they, they, they have a lot of new people. They don't know you guys. So kind of make sure we introduce you. Um, the, I, I just want to tell you that there's a couple questions on Facebook. One is, because um, I've been talking about how food is not allowed, and then even a food subscription service to learn how to cook. I have heard that those are not allowed. I have heard a cooking class is allowed. So let's say you go to a place where you have a cooking class that may in fact include the, the cost of it, may in fact include the, the food. But actually having a food delivery service that where you kind of cook the food and learn how to cook it, that, that's been problematic. I think somebody should fight for that because I don't see the difference between a cooking class where you get food and a food delivery service where you learn how to cook. As long as there's a, a, um, a component of learning there. But I, I just heard that that's uh, raising red flags at places. So just think about that. Um, other questions, Ed? Yes, there is a question that I will post again in the chat for Lorna to translate it me. I'm not sure if it'll be the last one that we have the time. Did we ever get that other one translated? No, no, this is the same one. This is the same yeah, go one. ahead. Go ahead, Lorna. Um, well, community integration is a service that you can uh, get in the self-determination program. Um, you should know that half of my son's spending plan is under the community integration service code, because that's everything from that volunteer opportunity I told you about, to a cooking class that he's taking in the community, to the gym that he's going to join, um, and, uh, and then obviously all of his staff are there to provide community integration as well. So, um, so community integration is a pretty big service code and there's a whole lot of things that can go under it. Thanks, Lorna. Thank you, Lorna. Let's um, make this the last question because we it's almost six o'clock. Great, from uh, Magdalene. And I would like to say this is a, an SDP Connect first as of, if you've just put it in the chat, it doesn't count. But as of right now, Everyone who has asked a question has at least gotten one question answered, which is great. Yay. <laughs> um, how does FMS pay for Uber, for Lyft, yeah. for taxis, for things like that? Yeah, each one is doing it differently. Each one is doing it differently. So as you are interviewing the FMSs, that is a really important question. So if you feel like you're going to need an Uber or a lift um, on a regular basis, they're going to probably need to make you an, an account and they're going to monitor to make sure you don't overspend it, but they're going to probably need to, to make you an Uber account with their, their credit card or their information at that FMS and you'll be able to use it that way. So um, I don't know if there's any, FMS, uh, any FMSs on here who can talk about how they do it, but um, it definitely can be done because I know some people are, are doing it. Okay, so I don't see any FMSs volunteering how it works. We'll try to get that for you in the future. So we're going to end now because um, we have our Korean and Spanish interpreters who need to leave. Um, thank you all for joining us. This was a great discussion, fantastic questions, huge turnout again. 
Um, we'll be back. I don't remember when we're going to start going to every other week. I will talk to Ed about it and we'll figure out uh, if we're back next week or in two weeks. And um, we'll continue the conversation. Please make sure you joined our mailing list so you get all of our information and make sure to visit our website and get our books and everything. So looking forward to seeing you all next week. Take care. Bye-bye.